You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. How's it going? Hope you're doing great and thanks for choosing to listen to my show, Straight to Video. We're not messing around on this episode as I speak to a certified, undeniable legend of the 80s Hollywood rock scene. A singer who has done it all, seen it all and lived to tell the tale. On today's show is none other than lead singer and frontman of Rat, Stephen Piercy. Rat's legacy in hard rock history is undeniable. Along with bands like Motley Crue and Quiet Riot, they were one of the lead bands of the early 80s to combine hard rock with a commercial, radio-friendly vibe, massive choruses, flamboyant image, but still managing to keep the guitars loud and the guitar solos as over-the-top as possible. A whole wave of bands followed for the next decade, but Rat remained one of the leaders of the genre with multi-platinum albums and arena tours, thanks to songs such as Round and Round, Lay It Down, Wanted Man, Loving You's A Dirty Job, I could go on for some time. Even today, the band's songs are still in the public eye with appearances on it shows such as Cobra Kai and a brilliant US television commercial for Geico House Insurance. Yes, for real, and it's genius. Stephen was on the run-up to a live-streamed show at Hollywood's world-famous Whiskey A Go-Go when we spoke, so he was right in the middle of a press frenzy. So, unfortunately, this was only a quick chat, but I did get to talk about some really cool stuff from his very early days in Hollywood and the effect bands such as Van Halen would have on him back then. What is super cool is that after all this time, like decades later, Stephen is still passionate for the music scene he helped create and understands what an amazing time that was, and he's condensing all that into a new multimedia project called Backstage Past. This sees him sharing stories and photographs on his official website, officialstephenpiercy.com, and in the near future we'll see an actual TV show which will focus on his career but also highlight some of the important music of the time. Personally, I can't wait for that one. Before we get into this fun chat, have you guys had a chance to try some Dead School Coffee yet? Dead School Coffee is a brand new independent rock and roll coffee company from South London making some of the finest ground or whole bean coffee you'll find anywhere and I've been drinking the heck out of it. The guys at Dead School Coffee are offering listeners to the Straight to Video podcast a huge 15% off your order when you use the promo code STV at deadschoolcoffee.co.uk. Or alternatively, if you listen to this show at stvpod.com, then simply click on their logo in our banner, add your items to the shopping cart, and when you go to pay and check out, the discount will be added then. Nice and easy. And trust me, this is some good coffee. So back to our chat with the legendary Stephen Piercy. If you want to find out more about Stephen's music, both with Rat or his solo band, and also the brilliant Backstage Past project, then visit officialstephenpiercy.com or check out S.E. Piercy on Facebook. There's some great stuff on there. But right now, it's time to lay it down with the main man himself, Rat's Stephen Piercy. We did it. <laughs> You're very punctual, sir. It hit eight o'clock in the UK here and you were straight in there. Try to be. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I think it's coming through fine. How do I sound? Other than my accent. Perfect. Except your accent sucks. <laughs> That's like you saying mine does. Yours is fine. Yours sounds cool. Mine just sounds like some horrible common English accent. <laughs> How's it going, brother? I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm coming to you from Nottingham. I don't know how often you've ventured in that neck of the woods. Um, I believe we've been there a few times back. 84, opening for Ozzy. Awesome, man. We might have been through there later in the years. I don't know. 
<laughs> but anyway, how's it going? I'd like to go out there. Yeah, it'd be great to see you back over here at some point. So I think last time I saw you guys was at JB's in Dudley. What, Rat? Yeah. The band Rat with Warren and stuff? Yeah, Warren was in the band and I think Robbie was on bass and uh, Karabi was on guitar. Oi, mate. All right, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Was I all fucked up? <laughs> no, it was a good show, dude. It's a good show. Oh, I don't know. You never know. <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time uh, to do this and for Christy for hooking it up. It's much appreciated. You got it, brother. We're doing this because we know you're way cool. Nice one. So you have an upcoming show at the Whiskey A Go Go. How is it for you to return to such an iconic place which must have so many memories? It was, you know, insane because we opened up for Saxon, I believe, Rat. We got the opportunity to open up for Saxon at the Whiskey. And at the time, we were the house band at Gazari's, Mickey Rat Rat version. And by the time the original members in 83 or late, yeah, early 83, we got an opportunity to open for Saxon two shows, one night at the whiskey we took it and things went so well we just kept playing there became the house band and that's where we met our then manager did an ep got a record deal so it holds a lot of memories and i've played there before and it's just a certain vibe there you know you got to understand zeppelin played there the doors played there Joni mathis uh you name it everybody's been there so i'm just one of those and wasn't that the place you first saw van halen in the late 70s yes um i took it upon myself to drive up from san diego and i was more into guitars uh in the 70s you know so my friends like this hot band's playing gazaris here we go again and then now they're at the whiskey you gotta go see them so i drove up by myself literally early 78 just as they were doing their record i saw dave going backstage asked him if he wanted to smoke a joint he said yeah got back in then i wanted to meet ed i did we became friends traded guitar i mean amps and then guitars and you know right there is another piece of history and i'd sit on stage and watch them and i'd go back to san diego going there is a band up there it's gonna be huge so be it other than the obvious such as like eddie's insane playing and dave being one of the most iconic front men back then was there anything you saw maybe like the crowd's reaction that was like nothing you'd seen which had such an impact on you that you wanted to be part of yeah you know robin was turning me on to priest in the 70s and except and but you know los angeles had a different scene and that band when you saw them what i saw was they they played like they were at an arena and and that stuck with me and i always followed their uh you know kind of schematic and then when they became huge i already knew they were going to be massive and you so be it god bless eddie we remained friends for a long long time had there been like many bands that had kind of done that before as in like took let's say like heavy metal and hard rock but molded it to like a party rock arena vibe obviously kiss did it but in more of a theatrical kind of way but was there anybody else doing that kind of thing you know by 1980 when i moved uh mickey rat up to la the hot band to see was motley crew and mickey rat was starting to get a name and then when jakey lee joined they wanted to know who we were we wanted to you know have hang out and see what's up with them. And we became friends with Motley. And then the whole scene just got crazy. You know, that whole early 80s, not the mid 80s when everybody was, you know, Motley's and the Rats and Quiet Riots and were already on their way, so to speak. You mentioned them. Um... A little bit earlier, you was very focused on guitar for a while, and that was your gateway to music, and you wrote much of the debut Rat EP. Yeah. But much like Mark Torian from the Bullet Boys, you're more associated as a frontman. But Mark actually played guitar for Rat for a short while, right? Around 1982, and you wrote the song Reach for the Sky. You got it, and I just put a piece of it up online. Yeah? Yeah, go to my Facebook, the official one. I just put that up there. That is so ironic you say that. I put three quarters of the song on there, and it's actually a version that Rat recorded for Out of the Cellar. We demoed it. So that's a demo version that didn't make Out of the Cellar. You can hear right now. How did you guys originally meet? Did Mark audition, or did you just know each other from the scene? I think it was from the scene, and, and Tareen is known as more of a guitar player then. And I even told him back then, when he was playing with us, when Warren split for about a month or so, a couple months, everybody was ping-ponging around those 
guitar guys. So me and Robin said, well, you know, let's grab this guy. He's like a great noodler, you know, and he was kind of like an Eddie type guy. And we wrote, you know, co-wrote Reach for the Sky with him. It's never been released. I got to get it released. And it was the same with me, with Mickey Grant, until Jakey came at the band. You know, I was playing a lot of guitar. And then I figured, well, you know, I have this hot young guitar player, Warren Demartini, and Robin Crosby and I, you know, went for it. You know, that's what you got. As you say, you was like, you was gaining good traction with your band Mickey Rat down in San Diego, but relocated to Los Angeles, I believe, New Year's Day, 1980, right? Yep, January 1st, 1980, because of Van Halen. You know, I had introduced Robin to Ed, Chris, a bunch of my guys uh, from down there, and, and the music scene was huge, and we had a huge audience, but nobody was getting a record deal, and here I was going back and forth to L.A., to hang out at Ed's pad, you know, his parents for a bit and seeing them play and watching them grow. And then they made the San Diego sports room when I lived there. It was crazy. It was like, it was like, holy shit. How was it for you guys moving there and effectively, I guess, starting from scratch and having to build the name again? Mickey Rapp played for a bit as the same four piece, me singing, playing guitars, rhythm, you know, and then other guys started to pull it in like Jakey Lee, you know. When Jakey pulled in, the band was a good version. And that's what, you know, Motley was coming around saying, who's that guitar player? And then Robin started playing with us. Jake went to Dio, to Ozzy. Uh, We brought in Warren and shit, that's what it is, you know? It just blows my mind, especially for some for people from the outside listening in, how all these names just went on to do crazy things and everybody interacted with each other from just this community, if you like. It's, it's unreal. And you know what's a trip is... We ended up opening up for Ozzy when Jakey was in the band. <laughs> and Warren was actually a roommate with Jakey as he was joining Rat. So Jakey had to teach him all my Mickey Rat songs. <laughs> it's nuts, just all these old friends like meeting back together again. Oh, yeah, I was just going to go on tour with him. Yeah. You know, I got something called Backstage Pass and it's going to dwell in all this cool shit. We're staying creative. I'm all right writing all the time. Yeah. What else are you going to do? So that's why I'm releasing some of these songs. Stay tuned. I'm going to release something that's going to blow people's mind. Because, you know, I have such a catalog of stuff from day one, uh, 70s. And it's time that, you know, I didn't write songs to not be heard. I don't give a shit what it does. I, they need to be heard. Yeah. That's it. It's great because you're staying creative musically and you've got this back catalog of material. But you're also doing, like you said earlier, the backstage past thing as well, which is great. Yeah. Have you got like this massive archive of Stephen Piercy and Rat, let's say, memorabilia and memories? Massive. Day one. And I... And, you know, uh, I had a, I knew it, what to do back then. And especially with the music, because back then you recorded in the 70s any which way you could. You know, whether it's two-inch tape, you know, little tiny guys, uh, four-track, two-track. And then when you got to six-track, you were like, whoa, that's heavy. And that was 1977 or six, you know, you're like, yeah. You know, you moved to L.A., kind of the difference. 1980 to do my first single you see 16 tracks in a room and so you know what i mean i want stuff to be heard what was your kind of incentive to do the backstage past i'll tell you there are too many bands that have such a legacy that people need to know about a lot of my peers have sold millions of records some of those don't really care if you get a grammy or a, you know but you should be appreciated and let's hear the true stories and we're gonna fucking play some great music and this show is gonna be way cool but also there's a on ASY TV a docu series coming out and they want to do it on me. So I took them back to the history of Mickey Rat. Rat went to the old place in San Diego. So it's kind of trippy we're talking about this now. That's great, man. You talked about bands which have like perhaps sold a lot of records, but did you ever see any bands yeah. that blew you away who you thought should have been huge but just didn't get the break? I think you've mentioned some early bands like Venice and The White. Are they two bands which you've mentioned before? That is cool. You do, you've done your homework. There was a good band. There was a band called The Orange back in the Van Halen days when I bring my guys up there from what I call Dango, San Diego. And we'd see bands like The Orange, Quiet Riot, Van Halen, The White, Venice. And that was crazy, period. Because those guys never heard of anything in San Diego, you know, until I started going, hey, there's a scene. 
But Mickey Rat had a scene in San Diego and people were going, yeah, baby, he's right. And I was, you know, the only way you could make it, you know, or get a deal. You seem to be very supportive of other bands. Is that something that's always been very important for you? Sure. All of us were like even Jakey's kind of around there and. Uh, Warren, uh, a bunch of these guys, Matt Ford, uh, guys from played with Dio, and many people. And yeah, why not, dude? Because you know what? There's a lack of good bands out there. There hasn't been anything that's turned me on. Maybe that's why people are digging the 80s, you know, longer than people thought. And hence, what's going on? We'll tell you. This is how important these bands are, <laughs> you know? <laughs> So let's bring back the cassettes. You know, Round and Round is written on two cassette players. Go figure. I've heard you mention before you was blown away by Van Halen, but heavy metal was still super popular with its leather-clad studded image, and even Motley Crue were kind of doing a similar thing, but you wanted to be set apart a little with your image, so you adapted ideas even from, like, Duran Duran and Adam Ant. Was you seeing these bands on MTV and getting ideas there? Because MTV kind of started around 81, 82, so that kind of be around a similar time. Is that where you was, like, drawing your influence? from yeah because you know when this heavy metal craze happened this your english thing came about priest maiden you know except saxon when this stuff came to la in the early 80s it was like whoa so everybody adapted to it the earlier band studs leathers and and we kind of you know knew because i liked so many other bands and somebody turned me on to them especially Adam Ant, and I go, me and Robin were actually talking, going, well, shit, do you want to play in front of a bunch of dudes, or do you want to have some girls out there? And we're like, well, let's look good. I know we can do it. Let's become cement pirates, you know? And it's just evolved that we're wearing just rags, you know, whatever we could. And then we started taking on this uh a trippy image towards like, what what are they about? And then the music was so brutal with You Got It and Cheater and Tell the World, you know, people were like, what the fuck is this? Didn't you call it something like fashion metal or stun rock? I actually had cards made. Yeah. Because I was the agent. Yeah, I was the manager agent. <laughs> so I trip around stun rock and fashion metal and whatever else tried to separate us, you know. Do you remember the, well, it's, probably, it's a long time ago, but do you remember like the first reaction from crowds when you guys came out with the new image? Like, holy shit, they didn't know what to make of it. Yeah, it was like, pay these guys so they don't play. <laughs> You know, and when you're making a hundred bucks, you know, it's like, here's a hundred bucks and I go away. Thank you. But then suddenly the crowd started to line up outside the clubs and stuff with a lot more girls. Yeah, no shit. We played uh, the Troubadour once uh, on my birthday, uh, back to back, July 2nd, 3rd, in 82. And it was pouring rain. And the guys come up to you go, how much you made? I go, well, shit, he just paid us in booze. And we sold out two shows in a rainy day for two days. Maybe got a hundred bucks too. You know, it's just shit you did. I know we tight on time, Stephen, so I'll kind of bring things to a close. Whilst rap being influenced by the likes of Van Halen and, let's say, Kiss for that feel-good rock and roll party vibe, Rat, along with Motley Crue, Quiet Riot, you were the original forerunners of what would become the massively successful hard rock scene of the 80s. So you're right there from the start, right through its entire A-Day. What I was wondering, though, you guys were constantly on tour and then straight back into the studio for many years. Did you ever get a chance to return to the strip to experience something you guys had a massive hand in creating over those years? You know, I have and I tried. I actually used to bring a camera when we were off the road because I'd like to go out in L.A. That's how we discovered Poison. I have stuff on film that'll blow your mind backstage pass. And, you know, I trip with a camera and, and then I started seeing in the scene but by 87 6 the only band that was worth a shit is i was hanging out me and steven adler became buddies i don't know how and he'd bring me music and gnr that's when i knew something's coming because rat was already off and running we've been doing arena tours for years and i didn't say anything in la worth the shit you know some we took out on the road a few just because they became successful, because it was the thing to do in the 80s. <laughs> you know, have the longevity is one thing. You know what I'm saying? How cool is it for you now, though, Tia, your music on shows like Cobra Kai and New Generation still discovering it? I mean, even Mickey Rat music is making appearances on soundtracks, right? 
Yeah, sure enough. TV shows and stuff. I got to tell you, it's interesting. E- even doing the Geico round and round and chart again, top 20. It's like, okay, it was an exciting, dangerous, you know, visual, anything wet. That was the best thing about the 1980s. And that's why backstage pass is important. And unfortunately, a lot of these brothers aren't with us. And a lot of the 90s bands, whether they admit it or not, were influenced by the Rats, Motley's, and, you know, whoever else that became Van Halen. And see, Southern California was a whole trip. It was like the Doors. As a matter of fact, Gazaris, The Doors, Van Halen, Rat, The Whiskey, Doors, Van Halen, Motley, Rat. I mean, The Whiskey, forget it. Love talking to you. Hopefully see you in the UK sometime soon. I appreciate it, Brian. Thank you so much. Stephen Piercy, how about that? Whilst brief, I had a lot of fun chatting to Stephen and want to thank him for sharing such great stories and generally just being a cool guy. As mentioned, please check out officialstephenpiercy.com for everything you need to know about Stephen, Rat and Backstage Past. And for all other episodes of the Straight to Video podcast, then head on over to stvpod.com where you can listen to everything there. I also have a support page if you'd like to show the podcast some love by buying me a coffee, which sends a small donation of your choice to the show, which helps with costs and equipment upgrades to help make things even cooler for you all. Every bit is appreciated, or if you can't do that, please consider sharing the show with friends or leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you to everyone who has already done that. really means a lot. So next time we chat, we'll be hitting 80 episodes. Holy crap. That 100 episode milestone is getting closer. Thanks so much for listening and enjoying the show. Really does mean a bunch and keeps a fire on my backside to try and continue to do a good job for you lot. Can't wait to talk to you all again soon. Take care and catch you there.